12 years ago, August 26, 2009, Officer Todd Stroud reported to work at the Concord Police Department and because of his experience as a school resource officer, he was asked to look after a woman who was at the police station with her two young daughters. That woman he soon learned was JC Dugard, who 18 years before had been kidnapped as she walked to a school bus stop in South Lake Tahoe one morning and had not been seen since. The question here is how did she manage to escape from her captures after 18 years and why until then? In today's episode, we're going to get into details concerning Dugard's kidnapping, but before we start our video, make sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. In September 1990, Dugard and her family relocated from the Los Angeles County city of Arcadia to Mayors, a rural town south of South Lake Tahoe, California, because they believed it was a more protected area. JC was close to her mother, Terry Probine, and her infant half-sister Shaina, who was born in 1990. Her biological father, Kane Slayton, did not know he had fathered a child, and although her mother married a man named Carl Probine, Dogard was never close to him. Dogard was 11 years old back then. While she was walking down the hill against traffic to catch the school bus, a gray car approached her as she was halfway. At first, she thought that the man driving the car would ask for directions. However, when Philip Greg Gardio rolled down the window, he shocked her with a stun gun and abducted her. While his wife Nancy held Dogard down in the car as she drifted in and out of consciousness during the three-hour drive to the Gardio home in Antioch, 120 miles away. In the heat of kidnapping the little girl, JC's stepfather Carl Probine saw the abduction through his home's garage window and attempted to chase the car down on his bicycle but was outrun. Some of Dogard's classmates were also witnesses to the abduction. Probine immediately called the local authorities who were raided by the FBI in their search, which included dogs, aircrafts, and hundreds of law enforcement personnel. But to not avail, Dogart wasn't found. They couldn't find any information about her capture, for he left no leads. We can't of course carry on with our episode without establishing the identity of this Philip Cardillo. He was a convicted sex offender who had spent 11 years in prison before being released on parole in 1988. It was while behind bars at a federal penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kansas, that's where he met his wife, Nancy Bocanegra, who was the niece of a fellow inmate they married in 1981. Soon after his release from prison, the Garridos moved to Antioch, a suburb of Sarcamento not too far from where JC's family lived. In 1972, Garrido was arrested for ragging and raping a 14-year-old girl Unfortunately, the charges were dropped after the victim had refused to testify. And in 1976, he abducted a 25-year-old woman and raped her in a warehouse. Likely, this time he was caught and sentenced to 50 years in a federal prison for kidnapping and another 5 years to a life on state charges for sexual assault. However, he served only 11 years earning his parole in 1988. He then decided to cool things down, he started small printing business, but shortly afterward, he became more of a religious fanatic, creating a website and a machine through which he could ostensibly convey divine messages as part of his God's Desire organization. Now we come back to the main story. Three years after his release from prison, he abducted JC, who was hidden from view in their backyard in which featured two sheds, two tents, a simple outhouse, and a shower. One of the shades was soundproofed, in which the couple removed Dogart's clothing leaving only a butterfly-shaped ring that she hid from them for the next 18 years. On the first day of her kidnapping, Garrido raped the little girl and let her naked in the tent house, which he locked warning her that Doberman pinchers were outside and trained to attack her if she tried to escape. During that period, Dogart's only human contact was Garrido, who sometimes bought her fast food and talked to her. He provided a bucket for her to use to relieve herself at one point, he also provided her with a television, but she could not watch the news and was unaware of the publicized search for her. Almost a month and a half after her kidnapping, Garrido moved her to a larger room next door, where she was handcuffed to a bed. He explained that the demon angels let him take her and that she would help him with his sexual problems because society had ignored him. Sometimes he would go on with amphetamine sprees, which he called runs, through which he would make Dogart put on makeup and dress her up and spend time with her 
while cutting out pictures from pornographic magazines. He even made her listen to the voices which he said he could hear from the walls. Garrido often stated the belief that he was a chosen servant of God. These indulgences would end with him sobbing and apologizing to Dogard, alternating with threats to sell her to people who would put her in a cage. After seven months into her imprisonment, Garrido introduced Dogard to his new wife Nancy, who would give the child a stuffed animal and chocolate milk and started crying and apologized to her for what her husband had done. But as it turned out in a 2011 ABC News interview, where she declared that Nancy was just as manipulative as Garrido. In the same context, Dogard related that Nancy exchanged between motherly care and brutal coldness exposing her jealousy of Dogard, whom she viewed as the one to accuse for her condition. Dogard also described Nancy who walked as a nursing home aide as evil and twisted. And as Garrido was returned to prison for failing a drug test, Nancy replaced him as a Dogard's jailer. Garrido was once again released on parole, meanwhile it was nearly three years into Guard's captivity. He began allowing Dogard freedom from her handcuffs from time to time, though they kept her locked in the bolted room. On April 3, 1994, Easter Sunday, they gave her cooked food for the first time because she got pregnant. The thing that put the poor little girl in shock, for she knew nothing about babies, therefore she started watching programs on childbirth in preparing for the birth of her first daughter at the age of 14. What's even more frightening, Garrido had no intentions whatsoever having mercy on JC. As a result, she ended up with a second baby three years later. Due to her circumstances, Dogar took care of her daughters using information acquired from television, doing her best to protect them from Garrido, who maintained his enraged nonsense and speeches. She copped and distracted herself during her captivity by planting flowers in a garden and homeschooling her daughters counting on her own 11 years knowledge. But at one point, Garrido forced Dogar to address his wife as their mother and to teach her daughters that she, JC, was their older sister. By that time, JC adapted herself to her situation, accepting that she is part of Garrido's family. Since Dogard was successfully brainwashed by Garrido, she was allowed to come in contact with other people, yet she was never able to ask for help. This resulted in Garrido believing that no one would suspect the nature of his relationship with JC. Nevertheless, in August 24, 2009, Philip and his daughters arrived on the campus of UC Berkeley with his wife and JC's two daughters to inquire about holding a religious event. This was the beginning of the end. One of the members of the campus staff felt suspicious about him. So, she asked Berkeley police officer Ali Jacobs to conduct a background check on Garrido. When it was discovered that Garrido was a registered sex offender, they followed up by calling Garrido's parole officer, who was surprised to learn that Garrido had children. Philip was ordered to attend a parole meeting, Nancy joined her husband as did JC and the two other young girls. Garrido initially insisted that JC and the two girls were relatives but began to crack under questioning from his parole officer. The questioning eventually led to the discovery of JC Lee Dugard, an 11-year-old girl who had been abducted while walking to a school bus stop near South Lee Tao in 1991. The discovery that Dugard was alive caused a worldwide media sensation and drew hordes of reporters to the Garrido home and to Placerville where the Garridos were jailed to await trial in the bizarre kidnapping. Philip and Nancy owned a small printing business during this time, where Dogard acted as the graphic artist. During investigations, a customer of Garrido's printing business claimed that he met and spoke by telephone with Dogard and that she did excellent work. During this time, Dogard had access to the business phone and an email account Another customer indicated that she never hinted to him about her childhood abduction or her true identity. Another customer spoke to Inside Edition in 2009 and said that things were unusual with the family. He recalled asking one of the Garrido's daughters what church they went to, and be known to him, the girl was JC's daughter, not Nancy's. She said, we go to church in our basement. He asked, how many people are in your church? She said, five. He said, okay, who's the pastor? Her answer was my dad. The man was a little shocked. Eventually, Philip Garrido's lawyer argued unsuccessfully that he was not mentally fit to stand trial. And after two years of legal maneuvers, the couple entered guilty pleas. Shortly thereafter, 
Philip and Nancy Garrido were charged with 29 felony counts, including rape and false imprisonment. So our episode has come to an end, but before wrapping it up, let us know your opinions about the monstrous couple as well as these tragic events in general. Subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss more videos of crime and mysteries and much more interesting stories. I'll see you in the next video. Take care.